Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ananya Shandelia, and I am from the Intradef team at uh, LinkedIn Bangalore. Um, uh, our team is responsible for creating various products uh, that provide observability into the LinkedIn infrastructure. We have a vast portfolio of um, products that uh, help the engineers at LinkedIn to detect, diagnose, and remediate any ongoing issues with the LinkedIn infrastructure. Today, I will be talking about one of those products, which is called Inflow. Um, Inflow is a platform for uh, the collection and visualization of network flow data. Uh, specifically, I will be focusing on um, uh, the data collection aspect of Inflow, which has been written in Erlang. Um, so this is our agenda for the talk today. Uh, we will start with an introduction to what Inflow is, uh, what uh, a network flow is, and um, how uh, uh, and an overview of the um, architecture of Inflow as a whole. Uh, then I will share some examples of how this data has been uh, helpful in um, various scenarios at LinkedIn. And then I will do a deep dive into the architecture of, uh, of the Inflow Collector. And then finally, we'll close with some numbers about how the Inflow Collector has been performing today. Um, so let's start with what uh, network flow is um, uh, as an introduction to the domain of, uh, of network observability using uh, network flows. So a flow is um, the movement of a packet across a network from a source to a destination. Uh, a flow is usually defined by this phi tuple which is the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and protocol. Um, so this, this file tuple defines a particular flow in the sense that where, uh, where it started from and where it is destined for. And there are additional in, uh, information about a flow that you can get, for example, the type of service byte, the interface indexes, um, TCP flags, if it is a TCP flow. Um, you can also get the byte count for uh, the actual traffic being, uh, being transferred in this particular flow. So um, how a flow is captured is usually uh, when you configure a particular network device, um, using some uh, protocol that is uh, supported by that device. Uh, and you also configure it with a certain sampling rate. What sampling rate here means is that if you configure a sampling rate of 1,000, then um, one in every 1,000 packets that is uh, seen by this device will be sampled, and then it will be exported to our external flow collector. Uh, sampling is important, especially for network devices, because it helps prevent um, any impact of the act of exporting flows onto the uh, uh, device's own performance. Um, apart from this, uh, there is another way in which we capture flows at LinkedIn, which is using our eBPF-based agent uh, called Skyfall. So Skyfall is an agent which is running on all the hosts at LinkedIn, um, and it it uses eBPF to capture various uh, network kernel events, and it uh, creates flows out of these kernel events, and then it uh, exports these flows to our external flow collector. Um, as of today, Skyfall does not do any sampling. So if uh, we have the agent running on a host, 
it will be able to capture all the network flows that are uh, being uh, that are happening on that host and it will help us get a full picture of uh, the network input output for that uh, particular host where Snapple is running. Uh, and this is an overview of the architecture of Inflow uh, as a whole. So as I mentioned, we have network devices that export flows to an external flow collector. Uh, this flow, collect flow export can be done using various protocols. Uh, we will talk a bit more about this in the later slides. Um, now the flow collector is responsible for collecting, receiving these flows parsing them based on the protocol being used to export um, and then storing them. It is also expected to aggregate these flows to a minute's granularity and publish this minute level data to a Kafka topic. Then here we have um, an enrichment pipeline, which is uh, responsible for converting this raw data, which is essentially IPs and ports and indexes, into a more enriched data set. Uh, so by enriched, I mean things like IPs would be converted to host names. Uh, we will use the IPs to get more data like uh, the source and destination sites or security zones. Um, we can also use the IP to find some geolocation information. Uh, we can use ports to find uh, the service that is registered for that port. And then once we have this enriched Kafka topic, uh, this is ingested into a real-time database on Pimo. And then we have a UI and API layer, which, uh, which queries this Pimo database to return results for the queries that our users issue on the UI. Uh, so this is a high level of how Inflow um, provides the required data to our users. Uh, so now let's talk about some of the common use cases where this data has been um, helpful for us. Um, so these are the three most common cases, uh, traffic and capacity analysis, troubleshooting network bottlenecks, and peering data analysis. We'll look at each of them in a bit more detail. So starting with traffic and capacity analysis, um, let's say that you have a, you have an outage between two sites, S1 and S2. And traffic and capacity analysis is when you want to understand the services or the flows that are consuming the most bandwidth in a certain section of uh, your infrastructure. And in this case, that would be between these two sites. So you would filter the source and destination sites on the Inflow UI. And then you can open the top services tab here. And, uh, and you would get a breakdown of the top services between these two sites over the last two hours. This would give you um, the top services that consume the most bandwidth. and are most likely to be the most impacted during this outage. And then you can reach out to these service owners and uh, collaborate with them on any uh, remediative actions. Uh, in addition to having top services, you can also use top flows to find out the exact uh, pair of hosts and ports that are, uh, that are contributing to the bandwidth. Uh, next, we have uh, network bottlenecks. So let's say here for an example that um, you have a certain interface on one of your network devices where you are seeing spikes in traffic, periodic spikes, and you are not sure what uh, kind of communication that is being captured is causing this these spikes. So in a similar way, you can filter out the flows for that device and the specific interface. And then you can group it by the entire file tuple. And what you would have is a list of the top flows that are uh, talking to each other the most in uh, for this particular interface. 
and using that you can figure out what is responsible for these uh, periodic spikes in your traffic uh next is peering data analysis so peering is when one network directly connects with another network to improve the network throughput um this usually involves some sort of a cost for setting up the peering and uh you would ideally want to optimize uh the different peerings that you have set up in your network and for that you would need the data on what are the uh, asns that are that are most common in your network uh, asn is the autonomous system number of a network uh, which is basically an identifier of the different independent networks that we would have so here for example we can see that 90% of all the traffic is for a single asn and in such a situation setting up a direct peering with uh, this asn could be uh, potentially beneficial to us in terms of both cost as well as uh, network throughput so now that we know all the various scenarios where this data is used and uh, how useful it is for various um, cases in in the day to day of linkedin engineers um we can have a look at the history of inflo collector over the years so back in 2018 uh, we had a different setup of the inflo collector where we used this um, agent open source agent called nfdum which would um which would capture the flows from the socket and then write it to files and then we had a python based uh, collector which would read from these files and um pub uh, parse them and publish the past data to a kafka topic so obviously uh, this kind of a system which relied heavily on uh, writing to and reading from files was not very performant as the number of flows that we wanted to capture grew grew exponentially and um we also noticed that because the flow uh, flow exporting happens using a udp based protocol and our um, and the writing to files was becoming a bottleneck for us and we were actually dropping a lot of datagrams at the udp layer itself so to remediate this uh, we launched the first version of the a lang based collector in 2019 uh the first version only supported one protocol which was sflow um and uh, uh with the first version itself we saw a marked increase in the performance and uh we were no more seeing any drops in the uh, in the datagrams that we collected and once uh, we started with this a uh, lang based inflow collector we have gradually added many more protocols and uh, to cover the various different kinds of flows that we collect throughout our infrastructure um we added ip fix support in 2020 uh, we added um uh extended our sflow uh, protocol support to include the flows that are expo exported from the skyfall engines uh this was back in 2021 and then um finally today we have various uh, clusters of the inflo collector running and we are able to process as high as 800000 samples every second so um now let's do a deep dive into the architecture of the inflo collector so at a high level um as i mentioned network devices are configured to export flows to an external collector um now this collector should be able to um receive this binary data parse it using uh, the protocol that <clears throat> that it has been exported in uh it should be able to store it and it should be able to provide read access to this data via a rest api or by publishing this data to a kafka topic so 
the intro collector has three main applications that enable uh, these functionalities. The first is FlowD, which is responsible for uh, parsing the incoming binary information. Uh, then we have Island, which is responsible for storing this data. And then WebD is our REST API layer. So um, to summarize, we have FlowD, Island, and WebD. And uh, uh, FlowD is responsible for parsing. Island is responsible for storage. And WebD is responsible for um, providing a REST API layer on top of this stored data. Uh, now let's talk a little bit in detail about each of these components, starting with FlowD. Um, so there are two different protocols that we support. One is SFlow and the other is IPFix. Um, now, since FlowD is the entry point uh, into the inflow collector, one of the main challenges that we have here is that the parsing of flows must not become a bottleneck for us in terms of not being able to scale to the rate of ingestion. Because uh, both of these protocols are UDP based. So if the parsing uh, of the binary data takes too much time, uh, datagrams will be dropped at the kernel layer before they even reach our uh, UDP server. So to, to solve this, we have leveraged uh, Erlang's uh, asynchronous model here. Uh, we have one gen UDP server for each uh, protocol that we support, SFlow and IPFix. And, um, and the gen UDP server uh, listens on the registered board for that protocol. And all it does is it receives the binary and passes it down to one of the fast server first. This ensures that the UDP server does not have to do any heavy lifting and therefore prevents us from dropping any flows. And then we have, and once the pass workers uh, receive, receive the flows uh, as binary, uh, binary data, they use binary pattern matching to parse this. And uh, once the uh, binary data is parsed, it is sent to the island for storage. So this is an over overall structure of what uh, the FlowD process architecture looks like uh, in, in our inflow collector. Now a little more detail about, um, about how we parse this binary data. So both uh, both the protocols that we support, uh, SFlow and IPFix, have extensively documented RFCs that list down the various um, structs to expect in the binary data, what are the fields that would be there, and what, what would be the length of all those fields. And uh, here you can see a snapshot of one of the structs in, that, in the SFlow RFC. And it has a very good documentation of each of the fields to expect like sequence number, sample pool, uh, drops. And then set against that, I have um, a live packet capture of uh, an SFlow datagram uh, being visualized using Bioshark. And here you can see that at the top level, we have the SFlow header uh, which has the datagram version, agent address, uh, address type, and the actual address, which has been uh, redacted here. Um, and then it, it mentions here that this datagram has seven flow samples. And then we have each flow sample, with, within which, again, we have a bunch of header data here. And then the raw packet header is a raw packet a packet header that was captured at the network device. So uh, now I have a few um, code snippets to share with you on how we use binary pattern matching to, um, to pass this data. 
So at the top level, again, we have parse as flow datagram function, which uh, is using binary pattern matching. So we can see we have listed down uh, various variables. So datagram version is one. And this is expected to have 32 bits and is an unsigned big integer. Similarly, we have octets of the agent address. Um, the agent address type has been taken as a constant here. And uh, and then we have similarly a bunch of variables. And then finally, whatever part of the binary is left is passed on to the next uh, function, which is parse sample. And whatever binary variables we have passed here is stored here in this uh, record. Now, the parse sample function here, we have a similar way of binary pattern matching. One interesting thing here is that we parse the sample, the expected length of the sample as a variable. And then we use that variable to, to uh, define the length of the sample data in the next step. And then again, similarly, we uh, pass it, pass the rest of the data to the uh, recursively back to the parse sample function to parse the next sample. And the sample data is passed to the parse flow sample function to pass the uh, contents within the flow sample. And again, similarly here, we have the parse flow sample function having similar uh, variables and the lengths and then the parse flow record here. And again, we have an example of parsing the IP payload. Um, this is an example of the PCP protocol payload. And then here we have UDP protocol payload. Um, so this is uh, uh, an overview of how, of like the structure of the S-flow uh, datagram. For the S-flow protocol, the rules for parsing are predefined. Um, we know exactly what to expect in the packet, uh, the various fields, uh, how long they would be. And um, uh, and yeah. And then now we'll talk about the IP fix protocol, um, specifically how we do stateful parsing for the IP fix protocol. So as I mentioned, SFlow has predefined set of rules, which we can code. But in um, in IPFIX, it is dynamic, which means that um, for the flow records that IPFIX uh, exports to our collector, we also we have a template ID for each flow record, and that template ID is is part of a template record, which is also something that is exported by the IPFIX protocol. So the IPFIX protocol periodically exports template records, and these template records um, define a list of fields to be expected in the flow records. What would be the order of those fields? What would be the length of those fields? So the entire uh, format of the flow records is defined in the template records. And this may change from time to time, um, which is why the the network device would potentially announce every time a new template record is found. So uh, obviously what this means is that our IPFIX server should be able to store this template ID to template record mapping in its state. And for that, we have kept the IPFIX server stateful such that um, uh, every time it receives a template record, this um, this uh, this mapping of template ID to template record is stored. And then when we are trying to parse the flow record, we um, we reference this mapping of template ID to template record and then use that record to actually parse uh, individual uh, individual flows. Uh, another interesting thing that happens here is since we have multiple nodes in 
a single flow d cluster it is possible that um one of those servers receives the template record because uh, all the incoming traffic here would be load balanced across all the various uh, flow d nodes so since only one of the flow d nodes would receive any new template record it is possible that the other nodes which have not received that record are not able to parse the subsequent flow records because they do not have the required template id in their state so to, to resolve this what we do is all of the ipfix server processes are part of a pg group and uh, they register themselves onto this group and then every time a new template is found by one of the nodes it will broadcast this information about the template id to template record mapping to all the members of the pg group so this way we avoid any failures in parsing so because the template id uh, mapping was not present in the state so that was all about uh, flow d now let's talk about how um, the data is stored in in uh, in the island in the islands um so basically island is a distributed storage for um, for all the flows that we have collected and each island can have n shards or n islands and um we need to make sure that each flow for a specific key lands up on the same island every time so for this we use this uh, hashing key which is for a given flow the device ip input interface and output interface is used as the key and what this means is that when flow d has finished parsing a particular flow it uh finds the key for that flow and then it uses p hash to to figure out which shard in the island cluster should this key flow send to um and this uh, the sending of flow d from a to a specific uh, island shard is done using pg um and here i have a small uh, code snippet so we can see that first we get the key for that flow and then we find the uh, start count for uh, this particular cluster then we use phash2 to find out exactly which index we want to send this particular flow to uh, this is a name uh, the pg name for that particular shard index and then we get members for this group and then we find a random uh, pid from this list and send the right request to this uh, to this pid now once uh, once the data is there on the island uh, this is a description of how it is stored um, stored on on the island so this is a storage unit for every key which is device ip input interface and output interface for every key we have a single edge table um that would store all the flows for that key this edge table is um a duplicate bag because we want to optimize for a uh, uh, high uh, high high write uh, write queries and um and then for each edge table we have four processes that manage this particular edge table we have sample reader and sample writer for reading from and writing to this edge table uh then we have sample purger which is um so since island is only for short term uh, storage of flows sample purger is responsible for deleting the older flows or flow records from the edge table so it has a periodic uh, way a periodic function where it wakes up and it deletes the older flows um again with sample aggregator we have a similar um, periodic function which is responsible for aggregating the last minutes flows 
and then publishing it to Kafka. So this is essentially uh, how we handle a single key storage on an island node. And uh, this is a description of the write and the read paths to island. So, uh, as I mentioned, FloD would uh, send the write request to the island. Um, the command workers uh, are the entry point of these write requests to island. So, the command workers are the processes that actually register to that PG name that I mentioned earlier. And FloD, when it gets the members of that PG, it randomizes to one of these command workers and then it sends the message to one of them. Um, and then here it is important to note that uh, we have a set of command workers instead of just a single command worker because um, if let's say it's just one worker that is receiving all the right requests, it could become a bottleneck because in case of a high uh, high amount of ingestion queries, um, that the process, the message queue of that one worker would fill up and we could potentially have an out of memory uh, uh, error because of that. So the command workers receive the right requests and they pass, uh, pass on the received right request to the right workers. The right workers then um, figure out the exact uh, sample writer process for the key for this flow so that the dedicated edge table that we have for that key is the one where it can be inserted to. Uh, if let's say that um, the sample writer process is not found by the right workers, it means that we are seeing this key for the first time. And then the right worker would um, create the entire storage unit for this new key. So that subsequent request for this key would uh, be able to pass through without any issues. Um, similarly, in the read path, we have WebD, which is our REST API layer. So WebD uh, receives uh, REST, uh, REST calls from, uh, from users and uh, it sends this as a GET request to the query workers on the island. Um, the, que the query workers pass this on to the read workers, which then figure out exactly which sample reader uh, would be able to get this data from the edge table. And then this they re return this response back to web team. Um, and uh, as you can see, it is important for us that we have kept the write paths and the read paths separate and independent from each other because the system is write heavy. So we do not want uh, the read paths uh, to affect the the write the performance of the write path. Uh, now let's talk a little bit about the sample aggregator. Um, so the most common way of reading data from the inflow collector is via the Kafka topic. So it is important for us to, uh, to efficiently publish all of this aggregated data onto the Kafka topic. Uh, so as I mentioned, for each key, we have an individual edge table, which has its own sample aggregator process. Now the sample aggregator process is basically a periodic, uh, periodic function which would uh, wake up every minute, um, and it would fetch the last minute's worth of uh, flows from its edge table, and uh, then it will aggregate this data to a minute's granularity. What that means is that for a five tuple the source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port, and protocol. Um, it will create that as a key, and it will aggregate all the metrics against that key for the last minute. In this way, we have all the unique flows for the last minute for this, uh, for this key. 
And once we have this information, we will encode it to Avro. And then we will send it to the Kafka client workers so that they can be published to our Kafka topic. Uh, one thing that is important to note here is that uh, since the sample aggregator is mostly idle except for once a minute when it takes up to do its task, uh, we have set up the function in such a way that it's in hibernate mode while uh, it's not doing anything. So we have found uh, through various experiments that this has helped us optimize our memory utilization by a major fraction. Um, and now, uh, and then we have a set of cl Kafka client workers which uh, receive all of these messages from various sample aggregator processes. And these are essentially uh, Hackney based connections to the LinkedIn Kafka REST endpoint. So we use Hackney for creating connections to the Kafka REST endpoints at LinkedIn. And the Kafka client workers utilize uh, these connections to post the Avro encoded messages to Kafka. And um, I have a small snippet of code from the sample aggregator, which is. Uh, so basically, the sample aggregator ha uses timeout messages uh, to wake up every once a minute from hibernation and perform its task. And uh, once it has done that, we schedule another timeout message after a minute and then send it back to hibernate. So you can see here that first we get the timestamps for the last minute, we get the samples, um, then we aggregate them, send it to Kafka, send the aggregated data to Kafka, and then we trigger the next timeout after window size, which is one minute. Uh, so we have uh, all these Erlang nodes and how we monitor all of them is um, using the exometer library. Uh, we have found the exometer library to be very uh, helpful and it has a very nice API for instrumenting your code at various points and uh, sampling various metrics and then reporting them to uh, to the LinkedIn's metric framework, which is called DMF. So we have our own reporter plugin uh, on top of Exometer, which samples these metrics and pushes them to AMF. Um, uh, these are some examples of the metrics that we collect today. So for Erlang's node health, we collect various metrics like the process count, uh, IO input and IO output. Uh, the different kinds of memory of the node, like um, ETS memory, process memory, binary memory. Um, and then also some application level metrics, like uh, how many, how many, how many datagrams are being passed every second. Uh, and now some helpful tools that I have found when uh, when troubleshooting any issues in, in my system. So obviously we have collected all of these different Erlang metrics that we can visualize on the LinkedIn's metric framework. Uh, we have set up alerting on all the major uh, health metrics like CPU utilization, memory, um, uptime. Uh, and then when I have to figure out why my Erlang node crashed, uh, the scripts in recon, uh, like the crash dump analyzer and process queue analyzer are something I have used very frequently and they are, they are, they are very helpful. Again, uh, observer CLI has a very, um, nice interface for understanding what is going on in your VM. So, uh, let's say that I am having trouble understanding why the memory utilization has gone up. Uh, and I want to understand what is the process uh, that is taking up memory? What kind of memory is it taking up? Is the message queue taking uh, filling up too fast? So for understanding all of these kind of things in real time, as they are happening in your system, you can use Observer CLI. It is it's it it has a great interface.
and then finally um erlang and anger the book um it has a very descriptive uh descriptive information about how to understand what is going on going wrong in your system um uh one very good example here would be the uh the hibernation functionality that i added to the sample aggregator i was trying to figure out uh why i was seeing a memory leak situation in my system and um after reading this uh, the memory leaks chapter in this book i was able to figure out the solution for that and also how to debug uh, such scenarios is also very well documented here uh so to conclude here i have some numbers uh, we have various um, clusters of inflow collector running today and we are able to process 800000 datagrams per second this uh, since one datagram can have multiple flows this amounts to around 5 million flows passed by uh, by the inflow collector every second and um our aggregation system which is the sample aggregator is able to aggregate these 5 million flows to 3 million flows every second and the 3 million uh, messages is what we are publishing to kafka so with that i will conclude my talk thank you everyone for joining